Yo, this is your boy Gallagher. Welcome to Comic Conversations. I know it's been uh, what were like eight shows in, Missy. Mm-hmm. Missy's here with me. Hey, friends. Uh, she she did it. It's so beautiful. It feels so good. And it's really weird today because we're doing this podcast. We're sitting in a front room. We don't have headphones on, so we're like listening to our real voices, which means that we like really have to listen to each other. But the world is going crazy, right? Just a little bit, friend. Right? Yes. Maybe maybe it's been going crazy. I don't know. I just I was watching how two people just got kicked out of um, the house in in Tennessee. To see how crazy, right? So, mm. you know, somebody wants to keep guns and somebody doesn't. And so, yeah, they out of them. But did you see the speech on TikTok where he was talking about one of the representatives was arrested mm-hmm. for molestation and never got evicted? Oh. You know, that's some wild shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that just lets you know how just ridiculous these priorities are. And the fact that they have a super majority, they were able to out two black men. Yeah. Okay. And, and one woman. Well, so the third, she was the third, but they didn't expel her. Oh, really? No, they sent, I think she was censured, but a white woman and two black men stood up. Two black men are expelled. And the white woman stays. You know, so I learned something new about our government. Like I've been asking for like three years, how do you kick somebody out? And they were like, you can't. Now I just learned you actually can. Literally you can. can. Literally expel someone who is elected to represent people. Just don't like the way and then I, there is a district that is trying to lord i don't remember where it is and someone will tell us that they're trying to change the laws about how you can get someone to run so instead of like a republican and democrat running they're like well whoever whichever two candidates in the primary get the most votes it could be two republicans because this is a this is a district that goes democrat yeah and they they don't want that anymore so take over of democracy that is what we're watching this is the fall of the nation you heard it here first on common convo i'm just saying i'm throwing it out there in the world grab your guns your pitchforks oh, and your Lord tiki God. torches they already have them um <laughs> let, let me stop and behave because that's not what we're here for today we got a really cool Kanye. show fun Kanye. show yeah i think it's gonna be a new show right because we're gonna just jump into it right because of indiana and kentucky yes. right so there's these two house bills that they came out with which are, are extremely anti-transgender um this is a new area for me and so it's i'm actually really excited to have this conversation because as you guys know no conversation is off the table like we talk about everything like for the time you lost your virginity to the time you married your I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I was like, you keep thought. saying that. You know, I'm just going to keep gonna saying bad things today. We're not going there today. Um, but we got a really cool guest who said, hey, I'm going to come in and share a story. But Missy, you know her. I do. Um, so Rachel Klein Palmer, that's hyphenated, right? Did I did I say that right? That's it, you said it. Let's you get it. it. Let's go. So we're going to have a cool conversation about her life, her experience with her children, her child specifically, yes. um, who is transgender. I also learned something else new, which I've never made this mistake, I don't think, but it was really cool. So somebody told me, don't say transgenders. And I was like, huh? Yeah, don't never say that. Never thought to pluralize it. But don't say transgenders. <laughs> don't say transgendered. Gendered like it, as in like past tense. Yep. Right. Well, or even like it's a it, it's not a, a descriptor in that way it's not that person is transgendered that person is a trans person that's a transgender all right so we're gonna female, have female. A, a, a real conversation so those of you who are listening who have never had a conversation about sexuality or, or, or trans see i was about to say it trans trans um folks trans population however we're, we're i'm gonna fumble through this and they they graciously said that i could screw it up a little bit so hopefully i don't get canceled but if i do i'll just start something else uh, no, but, well, but we will get to do some discovery and learn some things. We're going to, you know, I'm going to briefly interrupt every once in a while when they, you know, throw out a definition like binary and be like, what does that mean? Because a lot of people, I'm assuming everybody knows what binary means because it's just a mathematical mm-hmm. kind of equation kind of thing. At least that's how I understand it. Yep. Um, but some people may not, right? Right. You know, mm-hmm. so we're, we're going to have have that journey. And Missy, are you leading this conversation so I can I shut can. up? And quit I can. Over here? Well, and I think the really important thing that we've done in our panel discussion and we do here is we are modeling how to have this conversation. That is the point of this. So friends, if you've not had this conversation, the point number one is to go in with curiosity, be present and be respectful. But it's okay to say you don't know. And it's okay to fumble through and use the wrong terms as long as when you are given the the term that's more respectful that you're here for it and you make the, assimilate that, make that part of your vocab. Absolutely. So that's what we're here to do today is to learn some things. So re- before, we, before we jump in here, Rachel, if there were three words, right, in the, in the trans conversation that people should be aware of, and, and if th- we can add a definition real quick, what would they be? Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, three words. I would say individuality. It's going to be more than words, but it's, let's do terms. Terms. Okay, let's go. Sense of self is a good one. And then I would say just strength because they 
you know, these kids are just kids. You know, they have only gone through, you know, 10, 12, 14 years of life and they have already decided, you know, this is who I am and I'm going to take a stand to be the person that I believe that I am. And I don't know about you guys, but like when I was 12, that was a really hard thing to do, to be, you know, to stand up to a population that is different than who you are and to say like, this is who I am going to be and I don't care what you say about it or what he says about it. This is who I am and I, I find strength than that. So I would say strength, sense of self, and individuality for sure. I would think that, and I think that those are great descriptors of the trans community mm-hmm. and the the gender nonconforming community. Absolutely. And that's, so that's the space that I'm coming from as a parent of a gender nonconforming cis male. So my 12 year old. Say that for me. Uh-huh. Really slow. Yes. Gender, gender nonconforming cisgendered or cis male. So for listeners who don't know what cis is, what is that? So great. That's a that's a fabulous question. So cisgender means not trans. So if you are the if you are, if your identity matches your biological, like as you were born the the gender that you were assigned at birth, then you are cisgender. So I am cisgender because I was assigned female at birth and I am a female. And my 12-year-old is cisgender, so he was assigned male at birth, and he is a male, and he confirms that. But here's the kick the kicker is we don't know until we're told. And for years, we weren't sure if Gabriel was cis or trans. Mm -hmm. And we really had to wait for him to to decide that and not even just decide because it's not something you choose to name that and to come to that realization. And this show is not about me, but Gabriel, from the time he was two, uh, expressed differently than you would say a stereotypical male. So when they, you know, put the ultrasound on my belly and they said, it's a boy, our experience was not what I picked from probably two-ish on, he expressed in a more stereotypically female way and would relate to things that were stereotypically female, toys, characters, his mannerisms. And none of that was learned. That was 100% innate and 100% just how he was born. And so we watched that and we we have journeyed with him in that journey that when he became aware enough of, of self and had a sense of self, he was able to say, no, I'm a boy. I'm just really going to always express this way. I'm going to wear female clothing. I'm going to have long hair. And it's very important to me that the way that I express is more feminine, but I'm still a cisgendered male. I'm just gender nonconforming. Yep. Yep. And so that's the, the I'm, we're going to be talking about the full spectrum today yep. of from cisgendered individuals to gender nonconforming and to trans kids. And Rachel. Yes. Yes. So first, before we jump, really, we're already kind of in, but before we get deeper in, tell us about yourself. So I am, I'm 28. I'm married to a wonderful, awesome man. And we've got three kiddos. And our youngest is six months old. And our middle boy is, he will be three this month. Gosh, he's so silly. And then our oldest is our kiddo in question here. His name, well, not in question. He's pretty, he's pretty aware of who he is. Um, <laughs> his, his name's Leo and he will be 13 in August. He is such a dynamo. He's a, he is a Leo. So he is, you know, your stereotypical fire sign man. He's just like hot. He's hot headed. And he, uh, he's been out as a trans male for about a year and a half now, which was prefaced with gender nonconforming, which one of my friends has said is actually a rite of passage, if you will. <laughs> yes, it's a way um, in. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, you know, we got to just... Uh, dip our little toe in the water. Yes. So he was gender, gender nonconforming and he went by they, them pronouns for about six or eight months, I believe, um, before he was able to uh, make the realization for himself that I this isn't enough for me. I want to, I'm, I actually see myself as a boy. Um, and we, with that, immediately, you know, asked him how we, we could be more affirming for him. And it started with just, I'm not comfortable having this conversation with my grandparents. Could you have that for me? You know, and so we would spark those conversations. And then as time went on, you know, we've been in a situation, thankfully, where uh, all of Leo's family is in- in- incredibly supportive. Um, so they have all jumped right on board. There were a few slip ups along the way, as we can all probably assume there would be. It's hard to have a 10 year old, someone that you've been around for a decade and then, you know, jump right on, jump right in with them. 
but thankfully he is a very loved person and they did. So he has been going by Leo and he, him pronouns for about a year and a half. And he's been receiving gender affirming care for about nine months, not including, you know, he's been to therapy, he's done counseling and all of those things before that, just to kind of help us through this transitional period. But his gender affirming care is located in Louisville. Yeah. Yeah. So it does tie right in there. (laughs) Throw on some of those sound effects there. Um, (laughs) So that is kind of where all of this ties in is just that he receives his care at UofL Hospital and it's been exceptional since we started to be seen there. Um, He receives, uh, he's got a gender therapist who sees him every six months and just sits down and screens him for any sort of mental illness, anxiety, or depression that he's dealing with so that they can follow that rabbit hole if need be. They also talk with him about his gender dysphoria and if it's gotten better or worse. So I know that a lot of an argument with the trans kids is that they are not, you know, they, they're they mentally ill in different ways and they're mentally ill because their parents have coaxed them into this life. And truly, they the medical professionals that are providing this gender affirming care are like so in there in the mental health. So let's address that. Let's Absolutely. address the idea of, first of all, let, I want to go back in and, and, and uh, give a definition or seek That's a definition for, sure. for gender dysphoria. Yes. Can you explain what that is to people? Uh, gender dysphoria is something that a lot of um, non-binary or non-gender conforming or trans kids or adults feel whenever they are to look in the mirror and not see the body that they feel comfortable, that they would feel more comfortable seeing. So, you know, that's why a lot of trans men wear, you know, they will bind, they will wear a binder. So like a very tight fitting um, under piece of clothing to reduce the size of their breasts or, you know, they'll wear baggy clothing so that you can't see any of their physical form. Um, so that would be gender dysphoria. So can I ask a question? So, and, th- and I think, you know, for people who are listening, who are unfamiliar, right? When you hear trans gender male or transgender female. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You want me to take this over? Please do. Okay. Uh, All right. So to answer your question, a transgender male is going to be an individual who identifies as a male. A transgender female would be an individual who identifies as a female. These are people who were assigned the opposite gender at birth. So transgender male would have been an assigned female at birth and now identifies as male and then vice versa. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. So, and I think it's important to say biological sex and gender are two different things. Yep. And I think that that's something that we often um, intertwine, that the, a person's biological sex is is equal to their gender. And also, I think that there's a belief um, that people really are just one or the other. There's a large population, a very large population, that are intersex. So people who are born with both external organs, both for a male and a female, or it's ambiguous enough that they can't make a call upon birth. Um, there's also a group of people that when you look at their chromosomes, they may, they may, you know, for all appearances, that is a male person. But when you look at their chromosomes, then they have um, two X's somewhere in their, in their genetic makeup. So gender is not that cut and dry but we definitely try to make it that way. We yes. try to make it a black and white issue. And so, and that's not new because I remember growing up as a kid learning about a term that was called hermaphrodite. And this was a person who had both genitalia, right? Yep. And, and that is not something we say anymore. And that's not yep. something we say anymore. So exactly. We, we got new, new. All gone. All, all done. Gone. So that's intersex. That's intersex. Mm-hmm. So thank you for saying that though, because now the listeners know that that's, if that's a term that you know from the past, then that's kind of along the same lines of what we're talking about. But that is not the term we use we don't um but we use intersex for for folks who have both external genitalia okay thank you for that clarity Mm -hmm. yes yes all right let's get it let's go and also i think it's important and rachel's using the the language they identify as because it's the it's the language that people can they can identify with the most Mm -hmm. but truly what we need to know is for example we're talking about leo specifically leo is a male yes um he doesn't identify as a male because that suggests choice that suggests Mm -hmm. that well i just woke up and chose that yeah um or that he even had a choice um in the situation leo when he looks in the mirror expects to see a male Mm -hmm. um and if he were to see something different then he would become dysphoric yes yep that is exactly right so i'm curious rachel as as a mom when you're 
when your child comes to you and says, hey, I, I'm not this thing that I was assigned at birth, what, what goes through your mind? Uh, truly, it just like for everyone in Leo's family, it was a it was a f it was a difficult. No, I wouldn't. I don't even want to say difficult. It was just a time of change, and I think we've all experienced change in our lives in some form, in some format or another. And it's not always comfortable. So I would say that with Leo's, you know, you Missy mentioned Gabriel having, you know, you went with Gabriel throughout his growth and knew that there was some sort of spectrum there. Uh, gender-wise that he was existing on. Uh, with Leo, it was a little bit different. The mannerisms were always a little bit off, but Leo also struggled with some ADHD um, as he grew up. And, you know, there are some other mental health issues, but he, so we kind of attributed it to that. So I was a little bit more caught, a little, there was a little bit of change and transitional thinking for me there. Um, whenever he came to me and said that he wanted to identify with he, him pronouns, originally it was wasn't Leo. I can't remember what the first name that he picked was, but I remember just the name was a big part for me that I grieved. Um, but, and then after I had a moment for myself, it was, it was like, well, this, this guy is, you know, I'm no longer the main character. I'm no longer in the driver's seat. Like with my kids, they are the ones that are in the driver's seat. I'm just along, I'm in the passenger seat, helping them along the way. And so it was just the briefest, maybe a, <laughs> it seems like such a tough day to think back to the one day that he came out, but now it's just such a blip. And seems so silly because it's not he's not a different kid he's still my kid and he the only thing that changed truly was his name and he's able to tell me his truth and be the person that he feels the most comfortable being and my child before that was you know anyone that saw him could probably uh, attest to this he was kind of a shell of a person and you know so we spent all of this time trying to figure out why that could be and then once he came out and started receiving the care and being called the name and pronouns that he requested and the ones that he truly felt were who he was, it was just, you know, he blossomed. And so it doesn't really, to me now, looking back, it doesn't really matter how I felt when the day came that he told me and felt comfortable enough. Now I look back and it's like, that was a really pivotal moment in our relationship as mother and mm -hmm. child because he was able to say, I trust my mom. I love my mom. My mom loves me. And I think that our relationship is going to only get better and she's going to be able to help me through it. So I think that, you know, now we have, you know, so much more space for each other. Also curious, when mm -hmm. you mentioned the gender-affirming care that he is receiving. Sure. So we obviously know mental health treatment mm -hmm. is part of that. And I think that that's really important for people to know. So can you define for us what that looks like in addition to, so we have mental health, which I think is that such an important piece to say that that's part of it, yes. that you have professionals talking to your child mm -hmm. And you're not there. You're not driving that conversation. Yeah. You have professionals who are assessing the situation and who are speaking to the validity of what is happening, of what they're being told. And they are experts in the field. Yes. And providing that care and providing context to, okay, Leo says, I feel X. Does this fit the rubric of what we're looking for? Absolutely. So he can continue to get his gender affirming care. Yes. So in addition to the mental health treatment, what else does he receive? Um, he has been receiving injections of a um, puberty blocker called Lupron, and it is something that he receives once every three months, and it is through a third-party distributor. So we make a phone call to the third-party distributor who is in touch with his uh, physician's office, and we it gets delivered to U of L. We go in, make an appointment with the nurse, and it's just a quick 15-minute, you know, and it's not nothing to be too scared of. It's just real quick. Quick. And it provides him so much um, gender euphoria, which is the opposite of gender dysphoria. Um, so he is able to, you know, suppress any sort of menstrual cycle. That's what this puberty blocker does. It's a, it'll suppress his menstrual cycle because that, as you know, a man is something that typically would bring some dysphoric feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and it also hinders his breast growth. It hinders any sort of estrogen dominant progression in his puberty. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So when would they say it's a puberty blocker, it is just that. It is stopping him where he's at. That is it. It is not adding anything to the mix. It is not taking anything away from him. There is no surgical intervention, even remotely being talked about, because he is a 
child. Um, <laughs> and that is not something that they introduce e- until you're, I mean, at least 18, I believe. 17, 18, maybe for any surgical intervention, maybe. But, and that's only if it's a child who has probably been seeing counselors and doing all of the in, the affirming care that for they need years, to. Yes, for years. For years and years and years. Mm-hmm. So Leo currently receives his puberty blockers once every three months. And then he receives his mental health evals and he sees a th- just a therapist as well, just to keep us all rounded out, you know, so, hour and three. So what I'm hearing is the, me- the medication yes. currently on, again, you, it just suppresses. So it's yeah. not stopping anything. No. So hypothetically for our fun people out here in the world who just don't get it, mm-hmm. who says, well, they could change their mind. Mm-hmm. Literally, he could change his mind. That is exactly. Stop suppressing everything. Yes. And then that, it, yep. yeah. That is what the puberty blockers are for because, you know, I'm sure that some listeners have probably had kids that one day said that they wanted to be a veterinarian and the next day decided they wanted to, you know, be an, you know, a marine biologist or something. And so it's like they can change their minds on a dime, but gender's not that way. You know, it's something that you're born and you grow up knowing that there's this dichotomy, this black and white and society society of gender. And, you know, kids aren't ignorant to that. Kids learn from what they see. And that's what they plaster all over everything is that girls wear pink and boys wear blue. And, you know, girls like dolls and boys like cars. And so that's something that our kids are not, you know, naive to. They see this, they grow up with this. So they're aware of what gender is and what makes them feel good. And so with that being said, you know, it's something that is if they hypothetically, again, were to be on these puberty blockers because they are so young at this point, but medical professionals still believe that they are a person that deserves to make their own choices about their bodies, then if the puberty blockers are helping them to feel better, that's great. If at 14, whenever they can start taking, and don't quote me on this, this is, you know, it varies by state and medical professional, but we were told that with the care that we've been receiving, hormone replacement therapy, so testosterone injections would be a possibility for our kids when he was 14 years old. Um, so at that point, we would switch off of the blockers to a hormone injection. But that's after pausing things for two years for him to be able to assess if he wants to continue with hormone replacement therapy. So it's something to just curb the dysphoria for long enough that he is in a place where he is um, his mental headspace is more grown and more mature and he's able to rationally, you know, probably say some of the reasons that he feels dysphoric and, you know, just that emotional maturity. So I really think that that's... And puberty blockers have been around, in case people didn't know, for a very long time. And not just for gender dysphoria. Um, It's been for, you know, children that have spontaneous uh, puberty and things, you know, way, way too early Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. that is some... And that is something that removing gender-affirming care can also impact is these kids that are receiving hormone replacement therapy for reasons that aren't just gender. Um, right. Yes, exactly. Well, right now they're just, they're pushing the envelope saying yes. it's all about yeah. gender care and that exactly. relationship. Well, and that will be an unintentional side effect. Absolutely. So those kids who, who are receiving it because they are six and having a menstrual cycle will now struggle to get the care that yeah, they I'm need. Yeah, I'm sure the physicians will not want to hear something from the insurance company, and it's gonna they're just going to be in a bind for that reason. So part of what we're mentioning is an Indiana House Bill 480. Um, SB one f- SB yeah well 480 in Indiana and SB 150 in Kentucky. Yep. Kentucky. So and and both of these bills stop anyone from under the age of 18. Mm-hmm. from getting gender care, medical Correct. care, mm-hmm. that are going through the transition, mm-hmm. yeah, transition, mm-hmm. right? And so this whole discovery, which for, for me as a layman in this in this world, what I'm hearing is that our, our kids, if, if, if they wake up and say, hey, this is not who I am, mm-hmm. they really can kind of go through a discovery phase. They can. Slow yeah. down, yeah. you know, puberty until they, they come to a space where they're like, okay, yes, this is something I really want to do medically, yes. and that is take a, can I say, full transition into Absolutely. Mm-hmm. being in a, in a new gender space. I mean, and mm-hmm. so... 
Yeah, I wonder. I like. I'm wondering. You know, I, I'm wondering what people who are writing these bills are, who are they protecting, right, and what they're afraid of in that relationship. Because what I've heard, what I have heard, at least listening and reading some of the stuff I've read, is that oh my God, they're changing kids at 12 years old. You know, they're they're, they're chopping off their penises, they're chopping off their breasts. You know, they're they're Insane. you know, and I'm like, none really, are they doing it? We should wait till happening. they're old enough to figure it out. No, none of that what is. You're happening. saying is they, there's a process. Oh my gosh. And it's, yes. and it's allowing the kid to actually figure it out. Yes. Right? So for a child to be considered, so when children are trans, and a lot of kids are able to, if they're given a safe space to do so, young children can name that very early. Because imagine imagine you, Miguel, that you're, you know, playing and everyone kept saying, oh, what a pretty girl. And, you're, and you know on the inside, you don't feel that way, that they're able to, at even young ages, say, I'm a boy. Like they're able to say, you're calling me the wrong thing. And in the past, a lot of those kids have just been ignored. And those those cries, but not always. Some families have allowed their kids to transition very early and they just did it very, very quietly in the past. And now we are being more open because we are in a pl- place that we're just talking about everything more as we should be. Mm-hmm. This is not new. This is not, and I think that for those who wrote these bills, they think this is something, this is a flash in the pan that just came out and we're harming children. This is something that has always been, if you go back in literature, if you go back in research, you find that there are a lot of people who've transitioned and who've lived their lives in the in the space that they feel and the, the place that they are more authentic. They've been doing that for centuries. Yes. Um, so in the reports where I'm, I'm seeing, you know, these these bills are being passed because they're protecting the kids, right? This that's is, what they say. This is child protection. That's what they say. The same states that are also making sure that our children can be shot in schools are protecting the kids by doing incredible harm to trans kids. Gotcha. And I, I definitely want to talk about that. But I think that a point to, to point that um, kids have to be three things to be considered um, for this treatment. They have to be insistent, consistent, and persistent. So they're insistent that they are being called the wrong gender. They're consistent. This isn't something that they say one week and then the next week they're receiving puberty blockers and they're persistent. So you have, you have medical professionals assessing these kids for these things. But also wanted to point out, once a child goes through puberty, the changes to their body are almost irreversible. There are some things. Now, there are some people who are able to transition later, and they thankfully they do okay. But there are some things that puberty brings that you can't undo. So these puberty blockers help protect these kids during this time that they are doing the discovery, like you mentioned, from these changes that can't be undone. So imagine how much harder it would be for Leo if Leo was in a place that he was forced to go undergo the physical development and have menstrual cycles. Um, as his mom, can you name what that would be like for him? Oh, especially to have taken it a- taken it away after he has been receiving the care. I mean, it it frightens me every single day. It scares me to even think about what his brain, like what will go through his brain, knowing that it is. Leo is up to speed as much as he has allowed this, like shown me the space that he has to be up to speed. So he's also, again, still 12. I keep him up to date on this stuff, but it's a lot. It's mm-hmm. a lot for me as his parent to handle, let alone a preteen in puberty with all of the emotions, like so many emotions. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so the thought that, you know, we we will, will obviously have to have this conversation. We still haven't had it yet, but it has gone into effect that these laws have been signed into effect. But when we have the conversation, I have already prepared myself for him to, I mean, he struggles with depression. He's probably going to struggle with a big bout of depression. And thankfully, you know, we are ready for that and we already have mental health in place. So that will be a, a beacon of light there. But um, I, I don't think it's going to be great. Let's let's jump on that because I, I was reading something in in the bill last night, and one of them was talking about the so in, in the state of Indiana, sex education is already illegal to teach. It's right? illegal and in Kentucky's. They're they're actually going to do away with the teachers, so they're going to penalize educators mm-hmm. or anyone who's in that educated space from being able to even discuss transgender issues, anything. anything. Well, anything really about gender or sexuality before I believe sixth grade is is how the Kentucky law reads. Got you. Um, yeah, but is it is it all sexuality or it is, is it well, just... So that's the difference. Because... And that's the conversation that we have a lot. It is funny how the dominant culture 
just becomes the norm and they don't realize that they are pushing a certain sexuality and a certain agenda everywhere all the time telling a story when a prince and a princess kiss in a in a storybook that's sexuality and you think that those books are going to be pulled from elementary school bookshelves not at all the sexuality will be there it will be heterosexuality only anything that veers outside of that norm is what then they'll say that's sexuality that's what we're barring but the prince and the princess are still going to kiss in the storybook but but even as i'm and i'm again not the smartest person all the time but sexuality and gender are two different things they are they are so how are we confused is it i guess it's intentional to confuse the two or to merge them as if they're one thing Mm -hmm. well and it's also a very common mistake that that gender and sexuality are the same, the conflating, conflating the two as one, that um, if you're talking about gender, you're talking about sexuality. That's also part of the point that um, the other bill, the drag ban that uh, that did not go through in Kentucky, that the drag ban um, says that trans folk and drag queens are super sexual, just inherently, that just in, in putting on the makeup, putting on the outfits, they're so sexual. Hold on, you just said that there is a ban on they're, drag. They're, try- so they're trying to ban drag. So we're going to so get... In Tennessee, they have. Mm-hmm. And in you Kentucky, can't, You they can't try. dress up like a woman. Um, so here's the question. I have so <laughs> what many. What does that mean? What does that mean? Right. Number I mean, one. Um, how are you going to police that? So you gonna I have some female that? friends who actually dress in drag, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. No. So that's so, illegal now. So they can't be themselves so or the change their makeup style. Um, so my child who has long hair, it, what is is it a problem that, is he in drag? Like he wears female clothing and he has long hair. Yeah. So is he, is he in drag? All the time. America hates his founding fathers, yeah. huh? <laughs> exactly. They that. all were in drag. They wore wigs. Women wearing pants. Like, when is yeah. women wearing pants going or having to be short hair? Considered drag, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's where they get to. My mm-hmm. undercut. Like, at what mm-hmm. point will all of this be on the table because we are not traditional family values? But yes, so Kentucky did attempt to, dry, to ban drag. The thing is, that bill got a lot of play and a lot of news, and SB 150 was creeping in behind it, which was, yep. in my opinion, just as if not more harmful because these kids are going to be put in spaces that we can't even begin to talk about the harm that they're doing. And I think we have to pay attention to that, right? Because we've we've got political folks who are out here pushing one thing, knowing that it it will get attention so they can slip something else in that no one else will pay attention. Yeah. I have questions about Indiana. How did it happen? How did that happen so quickly without us knowing? Were we paying attention to Kentucky? And that's why we didn't notice Indiana did it like that. Yes. Well, I think Indiana is a little bit more insidious than than mm-hmm. some of the other That's states. Fair. I mean, it um, was we're in under the southern of part night, of Indiana. Down. And so that stuff doesn't trinkle down as well sometimes. Oh. So you have to be intentional. Oh, to so see it. I feel like you just led into like the entire point of this project. <laughs> so we are not Kentucky, but we operate as if we are. Yes. And in doing that, we rely heavily on Kentucky's infrastructure. That has been really helpful for Leo mm-hmm. until, until now. just now. Yes. So what does Kentucky and Louisville have? What infrastructure have we been able to rely on them for that we can't really rely on them because we're speaking two different languages now? Um, I would say we, you know, we've been receiving our gender affirming care through U of L hospitals. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, when I tried to speak some concerns and, you know, questions, questions, comments, concerns to the people there, they pretty much just said that they were as much at a loss as we were, unfortunately, and they were doing everything they could. They were brainstorming, they were talking to the higher ups and doing all they can. They said that they were already going in and marking specific specific patient files with gender affirming care so that if this were to go through, and again, this was before it did um, in Kentucky, uh, they would be able to call these parents and, um, you know, parental figures and providers to let them guide them on the next steps. I think for us as a family, we fortunately are very privileged. You know, it was whenever Kentucky was in question, it was, okay, well, we'll just go to Indianapolis. And then, you know, Mm -hmm. like you said, they just slid Indiana in there and it's 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 passed, so that's off the table. And then uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital was our next Just option. Fabulous, but, fabulous, yes. comprehensive care. Uh huh. But unfortunately, they're probably next on the chopping block. Ohio so is Ohio not far is not far behind. So we were recommended to go all the way to Illinois for our gender affirming care. If the third party that we receive it from does say, you know, well, you're receiving it at a hospital in Kentucky where this is now no longer legal, and you live in Indiana where this is 
no longer legal, so we can no longer provide this medication to you. Um, so thankfully, we're very privileged. Um, and I know that and I say it and I'm very grateful for it every day, but we will be able to make the trip to Illinois. Uh, most people, a lot of people won't. Uh, yes. Now, now, would you have some concerns understanding that we're all border states? Yes. Right? And that's something important to know whether you're on the northeast, west side of or whatever part of the state you're in, that your border states really kind of govern right, yes. that relationship. So are you concerned that Illinois, since it is the northern part of Indiana, that they may follow suit with Indiana and then all of a sudden you're being denied medical care again? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that it doesn't end up that way. It doesn't, the trajectory right now seems pretty good for Illinois anyway. Remember when we talked to Ashley about reproductive rights and reproductive health care, Illinois is the safe haven mm -hmm. that we have. And without you take Illinois out of the equation in the Midwest and we are left Nothing. Lost, barren, we lost. Yeah. Like she was saying, our closest reproductive health care provider would be DC, I think, as if you take Illinois out of the equation. But Illinois right now is a safe haven and a place that we can go. I think they just said New Jersey for trans folk was a safe haven. So I think that might be the closest safe haven state. So every three months, you're going to take that trip to New Jersey. Yeah. And it makes me think of the Hamilton line everything's legal in Jersey. But <laughs> the, the idea that you mentioned that you are privileged. So you have privilege that you are able to make that, that trip and take the time off and pay the money required for travel to do that. How many trans kids do we know whose family either are not privileged in that way, who are now stuck, um, that their affirming care was accessible and local, and now they're going to be at a loss? And then what do we do? Yeah, that and, you know, the parents that aren't supportive, you know, some of these kids might be receiving care through hospitals or organizations simply because they take public transit or because they, you know, have a friend that's a little older or something and allows and helps them out in that way, shape or form. But I know that my child, most of his friends are in the LGBTQ community as well. Mm -hmm. If they're not trans, they're, you know, very, very gay or lesbian or bisexual and they, none of them have supportive parents. None of right, them. Right. I am just this sweet little safe haven home to these kids <laughs> that I have to ask, like, all right, what does your mom call you and what do I call you? So that's what's also so scary and frightening is that that just loses the accessibility for those kids. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So I definitely want to, to, to ground back into the place that we, in this podcast, we believe that those who are the culturally dominant group have mm -hmm. to believe one thing, have to believe something about those on the margins yes. in order to sleep at night. Yes. What is the story that it seems to you that those people believe about trans kids and parents of trans kids? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that they are portraying this image of trans children as mentally ill, sick, uh, twisted, um, changed by their environment, i.e. like technology and social media. I think that's a big driving factor. And I think that they are trying to capitalize on this like marginalized group already who for, they're just the weakest link. And if people didn't know, like, Hitler also targeted trans folk first. Mm -hmm. That was his yes, first yes, target. I'm just saying. The LGBT um, community wore pink triangles. Yes, and they, were, they did. They were the, among the first. Exactly. So, and I think that they think, I think, you know, governing parties, I think that they believe that trans, you know, parents of trans children are almost forcing them into this lifestyle, which for the record oh is not, it is not it. That is oh. not what's, it is not any easier. No. It, it is who would who would choose I will always choose truth for my child. Yes. I will always choose for them to live in an authentic truthful space. Yes. Who would choose a life of of battling for just to Everything. to exist. To exist. The just right to exist. Yeah. Who would choose this? Yes. I mean, it's a fight for my kid to use a bathroom. You know what I mean? Like, that's another thing. Oh. It's just these day-to-day -day things that you don't even think that these children, these children are dealing with. And it's, it's kids that are already going through such a tumultuous, difficult time in their lives 
already just because, because they're twelve. Because twelve Ugh. is hard, Ugh. and so then you mark, you throw in all of the added stressors of just you know trying to figure yourself out and realizing that like you don't fit in this body, and so I think that in reality, when it comes down to it, like they're looked at as this group of people who just don't know what they're doing and they're confused, and in reality, they know themselves probably better than a lot of us did at that age, and they're just they've got the heart and the voice to say it and share it and th- and that's scary to a politician so that that a a well-educated self-aware group is harder to control <sighs> also we can be the scapegoats we have there has to be a rallying cry yes the groups right now who are attacking trans kids are looking for a unifying message um, so we need to protect the kids. And that's their unifying message. And they're um, pointing a lot of fingers about what that means. Apparently what that does not mean is taking guns out of schools. Yeah. But bless. Um, what it does mean apparently is denying these kids the right to affirm who they are and lead to a knowable amount of harm for these yes. children. But we have become a rallying cry mm-hmm. for certain. So that's the the story that that we tell. And that's the truth. The truth is that these kids are safe. Mm-hmm. These kids are strong. Yes. What can Southern Indiana do, those who hold power, those who are hearing this message and want to affect change for these kids? What does Indiana lack? What does Southern Indiana need to become a more equitable, spa- equitable space for trans kids? I think things that would be helpful are just spreading uh, knowledge of resources that are available to the youth. Thankfully, I know that Louisville Youth Group, Mm -hmm. LYG, is an exceptional uh, space for kids of all ages and adults. Can we also name, though? That is in Louisville. It is in Louisville. So that right. is that is part of what we are we're talking about yeah. here. Is it's not it's not always accessible for the kids who right. our kids are friends with or our mm-hmm. own children. Yeah. So we're passing bills to ban transgender medical treatment. Yes. Yep. Transgender education. Yes. Which ultimately also looks like in Indiana transgender support, right? Because there's no organizations, no programming. Yeah. Not here, no, not in Southern no, Indiana. No agency. Really, there's nothing. Here it's eradicating an entire about. group. That's yeah. what is happening. So, and this is truly opinionated, but so I, I read in Kentucky one out of every five trans kids attempt suicide. That is low. In Indiana, it's one in three. Yes, and that's that's more accurate for national statistics. And so would you say it's because Louisville has more support than Indiana? I think, is, that, is that a I think that point? could be a fair, I get, that could definitely be a fair assumption. Um, you know, I as, if it was a Louisville study versus a Kentucky study, mm-hmm, and that is, mm-hmm. you know, but if it was specifically Louisville, yeah, I definitely think that would track because Louisville does have quite a few resources Resources. They've got a few, you know, small businesses that are owned by people in the LGBTQ community or even trans owned, you know. So I know that those are big safe havens for the community in itself. Mm-hmm. I know mm-hmm. that my, I've got a friend who just recently, you know, I met him a couple of years, two years ago, I believe. And he said that I was his first cis friend in a very long time, cisgender, meaning he only hung out with other trans folk because that was who he felt most comfortable around. So a lot of, you know, it's mm-hmm. it, it ostracizes an entire group of people and that's exactly what they're doing. And they are, they are ostracizing, eradicating and making them unsafe. And that number, the suicide, the, the, the kids with suicidal ideations or who have attempted suicide, those numbers are just going to increase when you take away care and support. That is all they are going to do. Yes. And so we, we have an entire, it seems like entire industries that are also lack empathy. Mm-hmm. 100%. Lack education, yes. just even I mean, just pure ignorance in the sense of not and truly. Some of this is probably willingly willful ignorance in the sense of just not wanting to see people for people mm-hmm. and wanting to see them as this thing that doesn't fit. Yes, whatever box, and, right. that yep. that box. Huh. Well, and again, it comes down to the idea, and and I I I am I'm going to preface this by saying I am a deacon. I was a deacon in a Baptist church. I am a very active member of a Baptist church in Louisville, so I do not hate Christians. But there is an idea that this doesn't fit the theology. So there's a narrative that they're spinning around theology, and somehow that is making our making its way into our laws. So a the dominant group's theology is affecting the laws that we are passing, yep. and that is never how this country was. Meant to run absolutely not um, but kind of is slavery 
I mean, not wrong. No, let's, well, really, let's really well, look at it. They Even really Asian, used... Asian, yeah. Asian folks were redlined out of being able to have housing and businesses and communities. Like, this country was built on the trafficking of people mm-hmm. and the laws mm-hmm. of controlling people. Yeah, so that's This true. is kind of a norm. This is yes. actually what we're good at. Yeah. Mm. You're not we're wrong. We're really yeah. good at this, right? You're not wrong. We're well, really the idea... Good. Well, the idea of the theocracy, but then using scripture to back up your bad actions. Well, let's let's talk about that. 100% the did Southern it. Southern Baptist Church church is full of the kkk you're not wrong and they rewrote whole whole parts of the bible to make sure slaves were in alignment yeah right? you're not wrong and there's a difference between colonial christianity and african christianity and etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's an even deeper mm-hmm. conversation like the one thing i definitely understand as it relates to this trans fight is that it is very similar to the black fight in this country right and and man so i can get passionate on that side of it now i can get passionate about this side of it too because at the end of the day it's the same game with the same people manipulating exactly. the world. They don't look like me. Yeah, they, they don't, don't look and act, act like, like me. me. They yeah, they don't talk like me. Yep. So That's ridiculous. And mentioning is. um the idea of not seeing people for people. So this is and again we're going to talk about Kentucky for a second. The Kentucky legislature, so there is a, a Kentucky lawmaker whose um, trans son committed suicide last year. And their colleagues, so this this lawmaker's colleagues gathered around her, gave her, you know, condolences and said, We are here with you. We we care about you. We're so sorry for your loss. And when that lawmaker pointed out these laws were going to create more of of her son that her there will be more suicides that you you said you felt for me when this happened in my family but you are passing laws that will cause this in so many more kentucky families and they did it anyway Anyway. Mm -hmm. they saw a person they knew a person because sometimes i think the answer is knowing someone if you know someone then you can no longer hate that entire group because you know someone who represents affected exactly you know someone who, who who represents that group and well i thought i hated gay people but i know a gay person i don't hate them so maybe i don't hate all gay people that's usually the way that hate and discrimination is minimized which is why segregation is so painful and so hurtful when you segregate groups and when you ostracize groups because no one knows anyone from that group and how many people are like well i've never met a trans person so they don't exist and but this group knew that this family was affected and they did it anyways yeah and i can't fathom how she felt as a mother watching that happen around her you know, it just makes me wonder who's funding it and where. And let's follow the money trail. It's oh, all economic. For real. Day. Yep. There Honestly. is a national group writing these bills across the country, sending them out to states. And you can tell that to, to be the case because even the people who are drafting these bills don't know what they say. And when you ask them the questions of how does this play out, they can't really name it. They can't explain because they didn't write it. There are groups, there are PACs who political action committees who have a family values quote unquote you can't see me doing that agenda that says we are we are protecting the traditional family and they are drafting all of these bills. Well, that would explain why Governor Holcomb can sign a law and say it's as clear as mud, and I really don't know what it is. Uh huh. Where? What does it say about us that we've got politicians just signing things that they have no idea? None. What they say, who they affect, what it's. I mean, it just the outcome of this. And so, one of the things that you mentioned was LYG, but Indiana, Southern Indiana, doesn't have a chapter or a meeting space. It doesn't have a place where LGBT kids can get together and and. Train trans kids specifically, so they can feel like they're not the only one. They're not so alone. I, I just learned about PFLAG. Do we uh-huh. have a PFLAG, PFLAG chapter? That's a really good question. I When I looked when Gabriel was young, because again, we were like, what is this? And we were the only ones going, we felt very alone in this journey that we looked and we didn't see a PFLAG chapter available to us. Now, what did, was available to us, and I'm glad you mentioned that, was a group called T-Play. And it was trans play group. And they got together in Louisville. And up up until this point, Gabriel would say things like, the whole town thinks I'm crazy. Well, you're four. You don't know the whole town. So, bless. (laughs) But... He felt very alone because he was the only one he saw who looked like him or who expressed like him. We went to T-Play once and he stopped saying that. He stopped feeling alone and he felt empowered to say, this is who I am. I actually think that that took some of that behavior that he was doing that sometimes felt even over the top. It allowed it to rein itself back in and be more authentic. He wasn't playing a part at that point. Mm -hmm. He was being authentically himself because he was like, other people are like me. I'm not alone. I don't have to prove my existence Mm -hmm. because there are other people out here living the same life I am. Sure. Um, so 
having an Indiana chapter of a group um, would be really, really helpful. Yes. Um, do, do you think having, you know, Indiana chapter groups makes it also a safer place, you know, for folks who are going through, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. I, I know society mm-hmm. is cruel. Period. So cruel. Absolutely. I mean, it, there's power in numbers and we all need support sometimes. Like none of us have all the answers. So I think anything of that sort would just be so empowering, not only for the youth themselves, but for the parents, because none of us, you know, we're all scared and struggling and trying to put on brave faces for our kids. But ultimately, like we're all just backed into a corner ourselves and just feeling really, really helpless amidst all of this. So helpless. And I remember, so during the tea play groups, th- this amazing thing would happen. The kids would play um, and they would have an educator with, an, with a curriculum with them. And then the parents would go off into a different place and they would say, this is what we're struggling with. My, you know, we're trying to figure out bathroom rules. And you mentioned bathroom. Mm-hmm. How fraught that is. Number one, who wants to go into a middle school bathroom, period? It's, it's gross. Yes. Even if you're a cisgender kid, even if you're a straight kid. Yeah. But. Thanks. Middle school kids are gross. Ugh, <laughs> but imagine you go into the bathroom, all conversation stops because you're not in the place that they expect you to be. How dangerous the bathroom can be for trans kids or gender non-conforming kids. And our kids will avoid them at all costs. Yep. Um, public bathrooms and... So how do we make bathrooms. bathrooms safe? Bathrooms don't need to be gendered. They, I mean, it's a, I don't, it's I don't, a I toilet. I agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, my bathroom's at home. Everyone uses yeah. the bathrooms at home, you know? <laughs> it doesn't have to be so a thing. Businesses can really help out, help about trans kids by creating non-gendered bathrooms, especially single stall bathrooms. So imagine the coffee shops that you go to. If they have single stall bathrooms, yet they're assigned a gender, it wouldn't be a bad thing to point out, or if you own a place like that, to point out or maybe change your policy that anyone can use a potty because it's a potty. Yep. So we're just changing the sign on the door and let's go. Yeah, 100% on that. Yep. 100% that. When you gender a single stall bathroom, makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. None. Is there a rule? I and mean, we may not know. Is there a rule or law that says we have to gender a bathroom? No, because imagine um, I'm going to name it. So Pearl Street Coffee, who are just my home away from home, oh, love, 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 XOXO. downtown Jeffersonville, love, love. Um, those are non-gendered bathrooms. And if you go, I think right next door. If you go, you know, right down the street to um, Coffee Crossing, I believe that's even a non-gendered bathroom, yeah. and that used to be gendered. They just changed the sign. Huh. Easy the peasy. Alcove, the Alcove, two four six Spring Street. Uh, it's a oh. bar. It also has non-gendered bathrooms and some porta potties in the back, which they tell the guys to go to. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Do you love do you love those signs? I don't like want the porta potty. You're a dude, kid. Yeah. <laughs> but but I get to use the bathroom, so that's really great. Exactly. So are we, you know, I'm just curious because I, I mean, as an adult and as a kid, I always use everybody's bathroom. Like literally, if I got to go to the bathroom and I can't get in the male bathroom, I will go in the women's bathroom. And be like, yo, anybody here? Nope. Okay, I'm going to the bathroom. Sorry. I know one time I did that and people came in and I was walking out and they looked at me and I was like, yeah, sorry, I had to go. Uh huh. No, that's real. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to use the bathroom myself. Yeah. So the idea that we can just literally take the sign off the door. All you have to do. Yeah. That's all you got to do is take the sign the off. The door, that's it. Right. Bathroom. It's Wash kinda, your hands. It's kind of like when it was a black and white water fountain, right? We, all we had to do was take the sign down. All you have to do. And it's yeah. still a water fountain. And it's still a water fountain. Yep. And yeah. um, oh, another wow. thing, another thing that I can imagine people who have power can do. Um, if you are a person who has any kind of um, privilege, power, access to power in yeah, Indiana right now. Any platform of any sort. Any kind of platform. Mm-hmm. Talk yeah. about this. Number one, talk about it. But number two, you need to be pushing on your legislator because- is this really a state where you can recruit? Can you recruit employees and say, come to our state when it's maybe an unsafe place? We don't provide reproductive health care and you can't get affirming care if your kid is trans. So we need to be pushing. That helped, that worked when it came to RIFRA. When Indiana passed the Religious Freedom Act, large companies, um, Salesforce, um, large entertainment venues and vi- businesses, I think even the Colts jumped in and pushed back and said, we'll leave. And... Uh, yeah, Indiana and Indianapolis didn't want to lose the tax revenue, so they they it's changed. Money. Yeah, it's they changed. money. Yeah, money. Got rid of that bill. Believe so. It's almost never. Do do companies selectively refra people? One hundred percent. Like be like, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to do. I don't want to shoot that wedding. Whatever, and that's fine. But I don't. I've not seen it 
put into effect. I was say, Indiana is prejudiced and racist as hell already anyway. Like, mm-hmm. why did they have to put it in the law? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. by the right. way, no. <laughs> we, <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for naming it. Um, we literally just took down some of the sundown town signs. Oof. Like, literally. They might as well keep them up just so you know, Lord, because yeah. it's well, a true story. You know, or just, just so you know, because uh-huh. we're safe and what's not is what yeah, I'm so, saying. So we, we need to, so I'm just curious, you know, as two parents, um, who have trans children, but you, you, you're sick. Tell me gender nonconforming. Gender nonconforming. I'm going to learn this. I'm like, I'm probably going to memorize it at some point. <laughs> you know, and my, my kid is, I, I'm, I'm assuming heterosexual. I, I don't know. We, we've had like multiple conversations, but only God knows where she is. It's her choice. It's her body. I don't care. But she's, you know, because of her, I'm, I'm probably more and more aware of LGBTQ rights, um, and the, and the things that folks are going through just because of gender and sexuality differences. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. How do men who seem to be sometimes the biggest a holes in this bunch, mm. right? How do we help? Like you know, and, and we because we all have power, we all have voice, we all have privilege, um, to some degree. So how do we just how do we help? I think the fact they're even asking that is the first step. Huge, yeah, Huge. Huge. and. Using your voice when you see someone, there is a there's a belief. Vance says it all the time. My husband, uh, as a white man, will walk into a space and he's like, every white man uh, assumes that everyone in the room feels the same way, so they'll tell you know misogynist jokes or they'll tell they'll they'll say something about trans people and they'll think everyone agrees. Be vocal about the fact that you don't agree. Mm-hmm. That that's hateful. Yeah. Um. And you know what? Push back for sure. Um. Use your position of power and privilege. And talk about it. Learn yes. the terms yep. and use them. Mm-hmm. So, Rachel, if is there anything that we haven't mentioned today that you want to make sure people know either about Leo, about trans kids, or about what they can do to make an effect? I think just the main focus is to talk about this. This doesn't have to be taboo. It is a very uncomfortable conversation. It is not easy to talk about. But the uncomfortable conversations and the ones that do hurt are the ones that we need to be having right now Mm -hmm. because the people in power are clearly not aware of what they're talking about. No, and they're having the conversations. And they're the ones signing things into law. So we have to get educated. We have to talk to our friends, you know, talk to the people that don't have trans kids, talk to the people. Because their voices still matter. You know, there's still a tally. They still need to know how this is going to affect their kids' friends or how it's going to affect their friends' kids. And so I think just talk about this. Make it, you know, tell your parents, tell your friends, tell your teachers. It's just something that needs to be discussed. And we need to all know that this is not helping the children. This is specifically targeting and hurting kids. We will see suicide rates go up. Our kids are going to kill themselves because of these laws. And again, it's unfortunate comfortable and it hurts to say those things especially as a parent of a trans kid but like that's how serious it is it is mm-hmm. a life or death death situation that we're facing here and, and, and i appreciate you sharing that and even on suicide like i mean we're talking about kids who are taking their lives because of kids and, and i think there's another reality that we need to face is that kids are cruel right and so parents teach other kids how to be cruel to other kids uh-huh. and and we're still taking the the focus away from the fact that we can all be better humans and, and really help each other out and help us all on the journey. All our kids are going through a thing, right? And so, you know, when do we teach our kids? And even as adults, do we stop attacking people? Yes. Mm. Whether it's verbally, physically, um, um, sexually, or otherwise because because of a thing, right? And I think we have to grow up and mature that way as a nation and as people, and it does start in our own backyard. Absolutely. You're so right. I, when Gabriel was in second grade, and he and he and Leo may have been in class together at this point. So. so Gabriel and Leo went to elementary school together yep. and, and became friends. <laughs> but second, third grade, a little girl called Gabriel an abomination. <laughs> and it was clear those were not her words. Hmm. Like, yeah. she learned that somewhere else. Yeah. And so we obviously did what we do as parents, and we took it to the teacher, and we took it to leadership. But... And, and the, the parents were very apologetic. But the thing is, number one, they didn't expect ever to be called out. And they said that in front of their child who then learned it. So like you said, they're modeling that behavior. So we need to be learned to be better, more accepting, more affirming human beings. And we model that for our children. So our children are not targeted at schools. So they that the kids don't feel empowered to target our children. And that will ultimately help with depression and suicide rates. But if they're not able to get the care they need, then that's going to continue 
yes. to increase. Mm -hmm. So on that note, we need to have more conversations like this. Rachel, I appreciate you sitting down and letting me kind of um, fumble through this process. Of course. No, thank you for having your story. me. Absolutely. Anytime. Um, we should do more of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope those who are listening, you have the opportunity to maybe be a little bit braver and step into a conversation, ask the things you don't know, and also be willing to listen and hear, right? It's, it is a task for me, if you know me, to be empathetic toward anyone or anything like i it's something i have to learn to do and so if i can do it i feel like everybody can do it and that's that so missy any final words no thank you so much for this conversation miguel and thank you for your openness and willingness to learn a new thing let's get it let's go this is your boy gala this is comic conversations and we'll see you on the next topic if you're watching on the video you can go over to apple spotify or wherever you get your podcast and listen to the whole thing if you're listening and you want to watch it's a lot more video than there, <laughs> than there is audio and i might even cuss out the guy mowing, mowing the lawn next door all right i'll talk to you later see you on the next show peace love and hair grease. bye friends yeah